moderate. Thank you. When I see the word moderate, I can't go on to that and think, oh my God, this is going to happen here. <laughs> and the word moderate is maybe especially appropriate to, uh, to the subject. Uh, the panelists are to our guests who we've met, Daphne uh, uh, Haley, who's introduced all of us to each other and to you. And we have a new panelist who's probably far better known on this campus than I am. And that's Cynthia Cohen, who uh, has the program for Peace uh, Building for the Arts and is one of the mainstays of the Epic Center. You may applaud. <laughs> I'd like to begin, therefore, with uh, Cynthia, since uh, she has a, she's only asked a question here when it's time to hear her speech. The uh, notion of arts and peace building, let's concentrate on pictures and visuals. I think that if you ask the average person on the street today, um, the pictures, do they, are they more likely to bring peace but to cause excitement, thinking that we have uh, just witnessed what a, uh, a video of the web has done and throughout the Middle East and beyond. And uh, I can even think of some picture and photo exhibit that somebody tried to mount at Brandeis not too many years ago, is that uh, there are numerous examples of photographs that cause aggravation. Uh, I think it would be helpful if you would share with us examples of the use of photographs or visuals that would uh, actually bring people together. Uh, do the arts really do this? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this question. Um, uh, and, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and for um, creating this panel and this afternoon's conversations. Um, when I talk in general about the arts and building peace, I'm always very careful to say that arts can be, craft can be crafted to contribute to the transformation of conflict, to the transformation of violent conflict. It's not, an, it's not an intrinsic quality of the arts that they do. Um, what we do know, and I think it's interesting to compare here, uh, images taken from an archive for research purposes and images worked with from an archive to create art, to create, a, to create an aesthetic experience for people, that these are, first of all, two very different things, um, but that uh, the meaning is is not um, it is a matter of, of construction. It's something that's made between the viewer and the image, so clearly revealed. But also experienced, I think, in your work, Dora, that you were um, imposing a meaning upon us. This was not propaganda. This was a work of art that invited us to bring ourselves into relationship with those images. So I don't speak about about. Um, artistic images for a second, and just say that it's clear that they're powerful, that they can move us in a very deep way. But the meaning of that and the direction of that power is uh, rendered in part by the ethical intention of the artist and also by the quality of presence and the ethical intention of the viewer. So I would say, you know, we have seen horrible examples of images inciting violence recently. Um, I think we've also seen examples, and I'm thinking about now, of a, of a large exhibition of photographs that was created by the Peruvian Truth Commission after the TRC, or as part of the truth and reconciliation process in Peru, that were carefully chosen and displayed in such a way that dignified the injury that dignified the people who had suffered so much during the violence. It was very clear in how they were presented that that was the intention. And I think that that is how they were received. So I think it, um, we know that in Northern Ireland, there are murals that were created. I mean, this is not photographs, but images that were created very much to perpetrate. It was a way, it was a way that the conflict was engaged. And we know that in the aftermath now, there are murals being created that are designed to bring the communities together in their process and conflict. 
So I don't think it's a matter of the medium, per se. Although we know that the medium is very powerful, and there's some particular things about images that are, let's say, different than performances, and that people can go back and revisit in this way that you can't do with a theater production. But um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think it's a matter of the ethical sensibility that informs the creation and the presentation of, of the images. Anybody want to contribute to that? Well, I think uh, the thing that's binding together maybe these two presentations that you're talking about, Cindy, is the, is the act of looking. Mm -hmm. um, so the process of viewing a work of art, a photograph in these cases, or an archival document, which is sometimes a work of art and sometimes not, mm -hmm. um, according to certain aesthetic standards, which is why I'm so um, interested in and hyper-focused on the difference between your archive and your art. It's really crucial. Um, but for that act of looking, that's the space for um, possibility to me. Right? For, the, for the conversation to turn, for people to hear one another, for minds to be changed, for knowledge to be gained. I think there, people often forget that images are a source of knowledge. It's a way of knowing. Um, and that through a, a not a, a even necessarily a cooperative, but through a process of looking together, um, meaning it's mined differently than when we look on our own, and it's generated a little bit differently. So there's something really important about facilitating that process and allowing that process and being careful and respectful throughout that process that can also, um, that, that's also sort of an important part of that uh, triangle artist viewer and then whatever is picture subject. The picture it sense. <laughs> so in, in that in that act of looking, there's a huge potential. Um, and that's why I brought up BTS and was so interested in your project, because I think everybody's asking about next steps. I think next steps are, are um, facilitating that process in different ways and exploring how you can take it much further for the people looking on both sides. And, and you talked about that, but there are educational initiatives that need to come. And I think in, in, uh, there's a lot of theory and research in, in terms of what people, how people make meaning from what they see. And it should be harnessed. Yeah. Look, let me ask you, uh, I'm, I'm not a technical person, not very far from it. Uh, I'm a lawyer, I look. And what makes me wonder, and it's folding two ideas into one question, the title of the book is Zoom In. And I wondered what a book would look like or what an exhibit would look like if it were called Zoom Out. Meaning is that the image would be really placed in a wider context. And I'm wondering uh, what difference does it make? What is the most effective way of providing images? Is it through museums, exhibits, books, slideshows? How? If you want to engage and to achieve the kinds of effect peace building, whatever, are some ways more effective than others. And uh, the, would that particular way also involve a measure of zooming out or is zooming in the way to achieve that? Um, I, you make certain decisions about 
the content. So you, may, you, you choose a different medium to make the images of the forest, meaning a light box and the size and everything else, um, than you do for imaging Samira, your cousin. And it's very important that you chose video for that and set up the camera in a particular way, that you make the image of the forest in a very different way, or the blue ruins. Um, you make black and white photographs of those too during the day that convey a very different kind of emotion and information than the, the ones that we have on view here. Um, so just to take one step back, there's also a lot of choices in terms of image production that are really important. And I don't, I, I, I have a lot of, I think there's a lot of experimentation being done about the um, dissemination of images into different kinds of formats. And here I'm thinking of an artist who just visited here recently, Fuzzle Shake, and, and he, he's a human rights photographer who experiments a lot with um, modes of presentation in his work, everything from posters to very formal um, art books to exhibitions like the one Dora has put on here. Uh, and I know you think about these things too, Dora, the, 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 the various contexts in which they're received. So I'm not sure if one is better than another, um, but it's more about kind of analyzing and documenting each context and trying to sort out what, what happens and what sort of, sort of effects you have. So in other words, evaluation, right? Which museums don't often do, but I think it would be really Interesting. I mean, doing Dora's show with no programs isn't really doing Dora's show, right? So without this conversation, it's not. We're not um, exploiting the work to its fullest possibility within this community in this context. So anyway, I, I think each each context has its own virtues and to be determined. Well, maybe Dora can weigh in on this because Dora, you actually gave us a couple of examples. Those videos are a form of documenting, a documentary. And um, then you have these, these works of art that um, you've, trained, you've created out of um, photographs. And so that within this exhibit, we see different kinds of media um, before us. Um, when do you use one? When do you use the other? And what do you hope the effect might be? I think it's two different questions. I mean, I don't, when I choose a medium, if it's a video of photography or light box, it's not a question of the platform. And you are talking about the platform, and it's a totally different issue. It's a question of artistic expression. And I think an exhibition is a platform as a whole, and not the form within the exhibition. A, a catalog or a book that you put in a library is a different platform. And when Samira was actually in, in, in the evening news in 2009, like they showed five minutes of that video, it had a totally different, it was a different platform again, and the reaction were, were obviously uh, different than seeing it within an installation, or even the physical experience of that video. Or seeing it with the rest of the family. I see, yeah. Yes. And so I don't think I have RFC of what's, what is the best platform. I think that's where you started. I think it should be, which, I mean, I feel like I have to attack all platforms possible. Mm -hmm. If it's the media, the newspapers, if it's uh, museums, if it's uh, uh, libraries. Uh, Me too. Because in a way, unlike what you do, I'm trying to, uh, I'm an artist, and in, 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 when I'm in the museum, I'm an artist, so I don't have to be the researcher that has one truth that is, oh, I, multi, multiple uh, truths that I uh, espouse. I can say this is my story, this is my narrative, this is my truth. I don't, I don't give the audience much space for his own interpretation on the narrative, but I do give them a lot of space to think about their own narrative and the way they think about mm -hmm. themselves. So it's quite different than looking at the picture and without knowing what you're looking at to start with. I don't know if you answered the question. Yeah, but most of made some new questions. That's good. <laughs> uh, it's the time for you to ask some questions after all. So you're nodding your head. Do you have a question? No, you nodded your head again. Yeah. Yes, please. 
opportunity for a conversation versus creating a slideshow where those pe pe community stories are taken away to a technical people who make all these decisions. So there's a lot to say, I think, in designing a, an artistic peace building effort about how to, um, how to structure the, how, how to make those decisions about what's presented and also how, what, what, what the forms we use. But I, I want to say also that, and this gets back to Imbal's question, um, the thing about effectiveness, and people have talked about this, is the question of the reach of the different formats and the duration that they have, and what kinds of conversations or interactions they afford. But in relation to the individual who's viewing, I think a lot has to do with the quality of the aesthetic um, experience. Because, Experiences that reach us deeply, aesthetically, precisely reach beneath the conflict-habituated discourses that we live within. And what creates this opportunity for a new awareness is that somehow we're, we're touched in a different way. So that um, in bringing people into dialogue with art, like we did with Doris exhibit, one thing we do is have people make art in relation to the art. Um, and that allowed them to stay outside of the everyday discourse first. And then, after that, after the people are invited to engage in that place, then we can talk again, see what, 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 we've, what new meanings we've learned uh, that are not circumscribed by the language that we're used to. Thank you. Please. I see two people. Are you raising your hand? Let's begin here, and then go we'll around. Um, just to add another, I think, critical element to what plays into what happens, and that's the event. You know, what, particularly for an exhibition or performance, and it's the venue. Um, so I think there's a particular
particular to me added power of this exhibit that is happening here um, at the Rose at Brandeis in terms of the, the kind of conversation and narrative that's dominant to me here. <laughs> and that it, um, uh, it you know, kind of in that teeter-totter of, of, of uh, it, it kind of gives a little balance and visibility to what's less visi visible or, um, or spoken. So I, I really applaud and, you know, that that's happening here. Um, uh, and then a question that that raises to me is, um, in terms of what could be next, in terms of that question, um, you, know, you spoke a lot about that, that sort of being at that sort of intersection of East and West, and uh, um, could uh, there be a similar exhibit here at the Rose that was about the um, you know Muslim Israeli citizen experience or the um, Muslim Arabs that were um, expelled? Could could that leave the like does the Christian piece of that make that um, like a bridge to what else could happen here? Well, you now have an agenda. <laughs> Dan? First of all, thank you all very much. It's been a hugely enlightening and interesting program, and all of you are engaged in riveting projects that I enjoy very much. Um, in, in 1936, uh, the American magazine Fortune, a magazine of American business, uh, sent one of America's greatest photographers and one of America's greatest poets on a mission into the south of this country during the height of the Great Depression. The, the photographer was Walker Evans, the poet James Agee. And they were supposed to document um, the Depression. And they, uh, they set out and ended up living for a number of months with, um, in Al rural Alabama, uh, with three sharecropper families whose lives they documented in kind of in, in, in intimate detail. Uh, and their collaboration was eventually published as a book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, which begins with Evans's photographs. The very first thing you see, without any captions as I recall, is the photographs themselves. And then you get Agee's 500 page text, which is in effect a 500 page caption. As, you, if, if, as it were, uh, accompanying the photographs. But I think one of the things that's striking about that, where you have a little bit of the same thing as Katrin um, presented, and, and in a way a little bit of the same thing as you get in the exhibit as Dor described it, with the importance of the captions, along, the words, along with the photographs, is that the ultimate effect, I think, of A.G. and Evans's thing is that what appears to be the relatively easy empathy of communicating eye to eye with the subjects that Evan sees in those photographs ends up through the caption process and the interaction ending up kind of, I think, encouraging you to resist the easiness of empathy. I think that's a book that ultimately is very distrustful of the whole notion of empathy as the goal of art or of documentary work because it reduces, because it creates false bridges, because it, um, uh, and, 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 and so it's, it's, it's partly about an introspection, which I think also all of you have already commented on, but I think is also one that suggests that it's difficult for art to make that bridge into the um, kind of straight move forward that some people would like to see. So, I, and I think in a way, some of the best of your work exemplifies this uh, in some ways, but also complicates and makes difficult the process of what, doing what we all want to do, which is to translate um, this kind of work into direct action. I'm not quite sure what that all adds up to, but uh, this is one thing that occurred to me as both a, a kind of appreciation of the work that you're doing and also a kind of internal note of caution.
Mm -hmm. What that means is that there's no one way, there's no one instrument to trying to achieve empathy, understanding, dialogue, what have you. But this is one instrument that has this very particular power. And what we've been trying to do is to try to understand its power and how it works. Uh, and uh, thank you for that very uh, I just want to say a com Go ahead. A comment. I'm not trying to create any kind of empathy. Mm. This is not my goal mm -hmm. in any way. Yeah, I don't remember you using that word. I never mm -hmm. used that, and I don't think that that's what art is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see that as the goal uh, of art at all. And I think that if you feel empathy to the characters or to the story, that's great. But I had um, some other response as well. And it's, it's okay, I'm trying to create a, a discussion. And it's not about empathy. Mm. Sorry, just... Yep, yep, but you have. <laughs> Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. No. I, I have it from you. But, uh, <laughs> and it's right. great, but I can tell you about other reactions as well. Yeah, that's true, which is close to the point that... I'm just saying, I'm not trying... It, it, it's not, I don't think this is, the, this is a, a, a goal that the exhibition is trying to achieve. Maybe educators within the exhibition are trying to use it for that, and that's, that's their product, their product. It's not the, the goal of artists or my goal. I, I, I'm completely, it's not your goal. But there's, but there's, uh, Sorry, people like to do, people no, like to bond in the room, but. I'm the, I'm the, you know, curator, educator guy people through mm -hmm. on a regular basis and talking about the work with students. and. And we talk a lot about the architecture of the installation and the different spaces you're asked to move through, and the lighting and the mood and the ambiance. And, um, and we spend a lot of time discussing those low benches and the headphones. And a word that comes up a lot is intimacy, mm -hmm. closeness, um, access, voyeurism to mm -hmm. on the other side. But a kind of, um, like, talking about zoom in, I mean, a, a really, uh, um, like an intimate experience with individual people who are real, and that's the kind of documentary aspect. But I wouldn't use the word documentary for your work, so I, I really, I think it resists the documentary in so many interesting ways that are really, really critical to how we receive it. It's not all tied up neatly with the bow. The, you know, the narratives aren't particularly linear, linear a lot of the time as a whole. Um, there's a lot of experimental film and two at home movies, all kinds of things. So but, but anyway I think I think empathy is a really important word that it, that does come up for a lot of viewers, whether you intend it or not, it happens a lot. And I think it's it, it's a result of the way that we're asked to experience the work in this space um, and in that order. So it I, I think it's a really valid point. And the, it, it depends on the viewer. Like well, everybody is ultimately asking themselves, at least in these classes I'm in, what's our responsibility to our fellow human beings? And I don't mean what's my responsibility as an Israeli job. All, all categories aside of labels and things, it's what, what, what's my responsibility as a fellow human being to this person sitting across from me. Whether that's an intended question or not that you're raising, it, it, just as somebody who's looked with hundreds of people now, it, it's coming up. So it's, it's interesting whether it's empathy or not, because some people are thinking, feeling they have no responsibility <laughs> um, at all, or no connection. But I have to say, most people start to feel a connection. So do you? Yeah. I mean, I think um, empathy, the, the idea of empathy, especially in contexts of violent conflict, takes on an importance. Is this working? Anyway. Takes on importance. Um, when people have, when communities of people have dehumanized each other, so they put them outside of the realm of those people that we care about, because that's what violence does, and that's what allows us to enact, engage in these acts of violence. So, <coughs> the empathy is a very basic, um, you know, is a very basic element of beginning to transform a conflict, but it's a very small part, and maybe not the part to just empathy. To, to emphasize in a way because it, what matters is how we act on it or whether we choose to act on it. And I'll just say this one other thing about why I think the arts can, can contribute in, in relation to empathy is because we, do, because we do become fatigued 
with all the people that were, all this all the all the suffering that were somehow in this world of bombarding uh, where we're bombarded with images, all the empathy that we're asked to have. And I just was, um, as some of you know, at, at a um, roundtable that was looking at the theme of resilience, and a neuroscientist there said. And I won't be able to give you all of this exactly um, with this data, but that empathy is something that we do become fatigued with in our brains. But compassion is not. And so, um, in other words, I can, whether or not I can feel empathy, I can still choose to have an awareness of someone's suffering and wish that it would be. And so I, I wonder if that complicates this question. Uh, Nahum, I think we're coming pretty close to the end. Uh, is that right, Daphne? She, she's really the moderator. <laughs> uh, I think the uh, pleasure and uh, privilege to uh, be married to Begit and Holly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know that everybody who knows her, you know that I cannot speak uh, for her because she is very independent. Uh, <laughs> but I think she convinced me on two things uh, that I can share. Uh, one is that art really can bring people together. And having been teaching about 48 and about the trauma of 48 and the history of 48 and uh, dealing with American Jewish students and Israeli Jewish students and Palestinians and so forth, uh, accepting that uh, the not that happened and accept, trying to understand the, the history. I can tell you as a, as a historian teacher, it's really very difficult. But those, those uh, exhibitions is actually about 48. Uh, but it comes from, as, as you said, Dylan, from a personal perspective, from, from the family. And that's a really very um, compassionate and, 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 and personal perspective to learn about 48. And this time, I would say the bad blood that we got from uh, the New York Times uh, article, everybody who came to this exhibition uh, felt something, not empathy, but compassion and empathy uh, towards the door, uh, towards the issue. So this is one thing. I think art really, she convinced me that art really can uh, bring people together. And the other thing is that if your, your exhibition uh, breaks down the rigidity of identities. We can put you in one spot. So this is another thing that uh, I think this uh, exhibition contributes to. And I think it's, it's great that uh, the Rose uh, has it here and the Yoru support Ilan and the Shishun Center and, and you and, and everybody. So I think it's, uh, it's been great. So I guess she would Agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never took argue with your wife, but I imagine you try the same. <laughs> We're going to conclude now, but before we do, Cynthia, you have something to share with us? Yes, for those of you, uh, all of you who are interested in this interface between art and social engagement, um, there's a really important event happening tomorrow evening, which is a screening yes. of the new film, um, Never Sorry, about um, Ai Weiwei. The filmmaker will be here to engage in conversation. For those of you who are in Ganit's class, um, Alice Kaliki and I will be meeting with you at 5 o'clock in the Schuster Center, and then the film screening is at 7, seven at the Wasserman. At the Wasserman, and there will be opportunities for everyone to be engaged in conversation with the filmmaker after the screening. An event not to be missed. <coughs> well, let me just say that this was an event not to be missed. And uh, we can't use the word reconciliation, we can't say sympathy, we can't say empathy, <laughs> but what we can say is appreciation. <laughs> and I think that there is total appreciation for you, Doris, Cynthia, and for what Catherine's to say, and Daphne, thanks for putting it all together. Thank you, Doris. Thank you.